Dear YouTube, as you know, under copyright law, I am allowed to use portions of copyrighted material, in this case, copyrighted material belonging to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, so long as this is used for the purpose of criticism and parody. Please remember this when Watchtower comes complaining because I've embarrassed them by using their propaganda in a way they disapprove of. Thank you. Hello viewers, well it's time once again for my rebuttal of the latest JW Broadcasting episode. I'm falling a bit behind in how quickly I'm getting my rebuttals out, so I do apologise. In my defence I have had a lot on my plate, and as you can see I don't have my bookshelves behind me this time, and that's because I'm in the middle of building work, I'm trying to make my apartment a bit more habitable, and a bit more presentable. So as a result of that, everything's a bit topsy-turvy at the moment and I'm kind of whacked out of my schedule somewhat. So you'll have to make do with these rather rustic surroundings as I go through Garrett Loesch's episode and pick out some of the points that have been most interesting to me. Also, progressively righteous conduct is compared to light. Proverbs 4.18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. I wanted to just zero in on just this one clip because Garrett Loesch points out Proverbs 4.18 and I completely agree with him on this. He describes the fact that the scripture itself is talking about progressively righteous conduct. So Proverbs 4.18 is saying <clears throat> that the path of the righteous one gets brighter and brighter you know, the only way is up. Um, if you do good things and you're a nice person, things will go well for you, is essentially what Proverbs 4.18 is saying. But you wouldn't think that that's the application uh, when you look at all of the times that Watchtower quotes Proverbs 4.18 in its literature. When Watchtower quotes Proverbs 4.18 in the magazines, you can guarantee it's to do with new light and trying to justify new light and trying to justify this crazy, crazy idea and doctrine that Watchtower has that Jehovah withholds information and actually allows false information to be printed by his followers until new, new, more correct information is divulged at a later date. That, in essence, is what New Light is. And I've argued in a previous video, check out my Increasing Light um, video, it's one of the first videos I did. But nowhere in the Bible does it describe a scenario where Jehovah gives false information, which would make him a liar, gives false information to his servants and uh, allows them to go on in ignorance until he later reveals true information to them. That scenario is not described anywhere in the Bible, but you have to believe that that's what Jehovah's doing if you believe in new light. And the scripture that's most often used to buttress the new light doctrine is Proverbs 4.18. And as Garrett Loesch honestly puts it, you know, the clues are there if you're willing to look for them. But as Garrett Loesch uh, hints in this clip, uh, Proverbs 4.18 doesn't have anything to do with new light, doesn't have anything to do with understanding the Bible progressively. It has to do with righteous conduct. Another area of neighborly love is participation in the construction of kingdom halls, assembly halls, remote translation offices, and branch offices. The construction of these is a holy ministry or sacred service. So there you have it folks, construction of branch offices or kingdom halls or assembly halls is a holy ministry or sacred service. Hmm, maybe we should listen to what Sam Heard has to say about construction projects. The governing body has directed that a number of our branch and assembly hall construction projects worldwide be delayed, reduced in scope, or in some cases, canceled. However, Kingdom Halls will continue to be built or renovated in proportion to whatever the brothers are able to contribute for this purpose. Isn't that absolutely astonishing? So, <laughs> in the November broadcast we have 
Garrett Loesch telling everybody that construction work is a form of sacred service. It's a special privilege. It's a holy form of serving Jehovah. Um, and also, and this episode is coming hot on the heels of the annual meeting, the 2015 annual meeting, at which Sam Hurd read the letter that was already read out to Bethel families because Bethel families have privileged access to information as we all know. Not all brothers are equal. And Sam Hurd finally reads this letter out to everybody that says yes, we are putting the brakes on construction projects or limiting them in scope. Um, what he doesn't say in the letter is that uh, Warwick is still going full steam ahead because that's actually where the governing body is most interested in spending money is on its new plush world headquarters because after all that's where the governing body will end up living so no surprises they want to make sure Warwick gets finished but as to all, almost all other projects well they're being put on the back burner and what I found interesting about just this last clip showing Sam Hurd uh, making this announcement was that he says well Kingdom Halls, you know, we might but we might still be building Kingdom Halls. It all depends on how much you brothers want to donate. Well, that's very interesting because um, only, I think it was in 2014, we had the new stealth tithing arrangement. I, I called it and a few others called it the stealth tithing arrangement because that's essentially what it was. But what they did was they um, basically removed congregation autonomy. So they told congregations, you're no longer allowed to hoard your own cash. We'll have it, thank you very much. But don't worry, we're gonna take care of all of your building and renovation needs. You can rely on us to take care of that. You just make sure that you keep a steady stream of money coming in every month. And by the way, if you have any surplus sitting in your account for a rainy day, we'll have that thank you because we are taking responsibility to look after your Kingdom Hall for you or your Kingdom Hall building needs for you. And it, isn't it interesting that already, already that's disintegrated and already we have this caveat that the governing body is only willing to build or renovate Kingdom Halls if they have enough money available. Well, you've already promised, governing body, that you will build and renovate Kingdom Halls when you took the money out of the accounts of local congregations. You have made that promise. You can't just then change the rules and say, actually, we might spend this money on your Kingdom Hall if you give us more. That's not how it works. You've made the promise. It's a two-way thing. You have to live up to your side after you've literally pulled the money out of the congregation accounts. So I thought it was worthwhile bringing that up since Gerrit Loesch so kindly mentioned construction projects in this episode. When we do good to others, the motive for doing so should not be just to have a better chance to preach to them thereafter. It should come naturally to Christians to do good to others. We want to do good, whether we can preach to them thereafter or not. We want to imitate our loving Heavenly Father in doing the right and the loving thing. Can I just say I wholeheartedly endorse and agree with what Garrett Loesch has just said there. And I think it highlights how clever Garrett Loesch is when, he, when it's his turn to do a JW Broadcasting episode, he generally plays it safe. He you know, introduces these broader Christian themes, the authenticity of the Bible, the importance of doing kind and good things to other people. He plays it safe. He, you know, I, I, if I was gonna do one of these JW Broadcasting episodes as a governing body member, I wouldn't do things much differently than the way Garrett Loesch does it. And this, uh, thing that he just says now about, um, well, we don't do nice things just because we're looking for an opportunity to preach to people. We do good things because it's the right thing to do. That is a, um, a, a humanitarian idea. That's a, a kind of a secular concept, really, because um, morals and, and the importance of doing good things to other people is something everybody should be doing, regardless of whether they're religious or not. And it shouldn't be with a motive in mind of trying to co coerce them or coax them into your own set of beliefs. So an atheist wouldn't do good things to a religious person because he wants them to become atheist. 
And a religious person shouldn't do nice things to an atheist because he wants them to become religious. It should just, they should just do nice things because that's the right thing to do. So I wholly endorse what Garrett Lois has just said in, in that clip. I don't think it bears any relation to Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> but it's, you know, I can endorse it. Um, and why do I say that? Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, when they look at worldly people, they don't view worldly people as equals. They, you know, if, if an ordinary person does a kind thing, maybe helps an, uh, an old lady across the street or gives some money to a homeless person, um, they're doing it because they can imagine being in that scenario. They can imagine, you know, struggling to get across the street. I can certainly imagine struggling to get anywhere with my back at the moment. But th there's a degree of empathy there and there's this basic feeling of human solidarity. I want to help you because actually I am you and you are me and we're, we're, in, we're in this together. And uh, if everybody helps each other, then life's going to be much, much easier. That's the, the basic principle be behind anything humanitarian or should be. But when you look at Jehovah's Witnesses, well, they do look down on people. I'm sorry, they do not view worldly people as being equals. They view worldly people as, um, at, the, at, at worst, evil, um, at best, deluded, and on a slippery slope. And where that slippery slope leads, of course, is Armageddon. So basically, anybody who a Jehovah's Witness encounters who doesn't want to become a Jehovah's Witness, in other words, doesn't want to embrace their religious ideas at some point or other, um, is worthy of death. <laughs> is worthy of being pecked apart by birds and or decimated by a fireball and or having their atoms ripped apart from each other through divine radiation. That is what awaits anybody who isn't a Jehovah's Witness or refuses to become a Jehovah's Witness. That is not an idea of parity. That is not an idea of equality. That is fundamentally looking down on your fellow man and pitying them and patronizing them and condescending them. So um, as much as I agree <laughs> with what Garrett Loesch says, about wanting to do good to others and not being overly concerned about preaching to them, I don't think that necessarily has anything whatsoever to do with the way Jehovah's Witnesses both look at and interact with worldly people. My name is David Slackman, and I serve as the chairman of the Hospital Liaison Committee in the Houston area. And the thing that I like about the Hospital Liaison Committee is that I'm not there for any personal glory, but rather I'm serving from the standpoint of helping the friends. Uh, I get a lot of phone calls, and sometimes the phone calls may come in the middle of the night. Sometimes the phone call may come during dinner time, but I'm serving Jehovah. I'm serving the friends. I don't care when it comes, I just want to help them. So when, they, when the call comes, the emergency is there, I have this prayerful attitude that, that I have Jehovah's Spirit to assure them that Jehovah cares for them. When we're visiting with the patient, the, the patient is very glad to see us. They, they, and, and that immediately translates from their viewpoint that Jehovah is with them. When we leave uh, the hospital and we know that the sister has been comforted by our call, it calls to mind what the prophet said in Isaiah 40 and verse 11. It says, like a shepherd, he will care for his flock. Jehovah does care. And when we see that's what Jehovah does for the individual sheep, and I'm able to try to imitate that, and also at the same time comfort the brother or sister, that's what gives me the greatest joy. Brother Slackman has been serving on the Hospital Liaison Committee for 22 years. And in that 22 years, I wonder how many Jehovah's Witness men and women Brother Slackman has persuaded to kill themselves by refusing medical treatment that's based on blood transfusions. I think it was in a video discussion I had with Mark Latham, if you look in the interviews, we had a conversation about this in uh, August 2014 
we were talking about how how the HLC uh, elders visit hospitals and basically coerce witnesses to stick to their guns and refuse medical treatment based on blood and yet at the same time Watchtower literature gives this impression that whether you refuse or accept certain forms of medical treatment is a personal decision and they really stick to this they really believe in this oh it's a personal decision well if it's a personal decision why does Watchtower have to send in goons like David Slackman to basically pummel through this idea that blood is to be refused at all costs. If it's a personal decision, surely the whole concept of uh, HLC elders should be obsolete because individual witnesses have all the information they need to make their own decisions and will do so, thank you very much. But instead, Watchtower knows full well that the human will to live can override ridiculous outdated, trumped up Bible dogma and people can disobey uh, these commands when push comes to shove and that's why people like David Slackman are needed to essentially help people commit suicide. Now you might be a Jehovah's Witness watching this and you know bravo for making it this far or you might be an ex-JW and you might be thinking well I understand there's lots of things wrong with Jehovah's Witnesses, but you can't really go there with blood because it does, after all, mention blood in the Bible and we are supposed to abstain from it. So really, even if they've got a lot, even if they've got a lot of other things wrong, they have got it right on blood transfusions. Well, I would really strongly recommend that you do some research on this and a great website to go to is JW Facts where Paul Grundy has done a full article on blood transfusions. I'll put a link in the description for your convenience. But the point is that, yes, it clearly mentions that you shouldn't eat blood in the Bible, but there's a huge, huge difference between ingesting blood into your digestive system and using it for medical purposes. And the Bible is silent on whether blood can be used for medical reasons. Why? because blood wasn't used for medical reasons in ancient times. They didn't know anything about blood transfusion, so the Bible couldn't comment on it. So when the Bible is silent on something, you don't then introduce a law and say, well, the Bible must have really meant this. No, you let the Bible speak for itself. And furthermore, when you look at the words that Jesus spoke when he was on the earth, uh, he would often appeal to aspects of Pharisaical law that dealt with the sanctity of life. And Jesus would use, for example, analogies like, you know, if a, you know, if a man's bull falls into a pit on the Sabbath, you know, which man isn't going to also get it out and save it? And he would use, uh, and he healed obviously on the Sabbath as well. For Jesus, the sanctity of life came first and everything else was fairly trivial if life was hanging in the balance. The first thing you do, the first rule is to save human life. And Watchtower's ridiculous and bizarre and sinister blood policy completely tramples all over uh, this principle that was alluded to by Jesus and basically what Watchtower wants is human sacrifice. It wants humans to sacrifice themselves to show their loyalty to the organization so that you can basically have martyrs. You know what religion doesn't want martyrs who can throw their lives on the line to, for the greater good and inspire everyone else to be even more devout and uh, enthusiastic. So please, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, do some research on this because it is important. And yes, your life could very well end up depending on whether you can manage to rid yourself of this ridiculous prohibition on blood. Hardware is a 24-7 economy, so you never know exactly when a ship arrives. You have to be flexible in your schedule. Adjust everything you can to meet the people there on board, especially when it is a return visit. You try to do everything you can to meet that person again. Maybe I'm the only one who was bothered by this, but in this last clip you'll have noticed that uh, we have this section on harbour witnessing and you have interviewed these individuals from Holland, these, you know, witness brothers and sisters who engage in ship-to-ship -ship evangelical work. 
and they're all giving their experiences and what you have <laughs> while they're talking are these English subtitles and they're speaking in English and they're perfectly understandable but someone somewhere at JW Broadcasting HQ has said, uh, well, we can't really, <laughs> we can't really make out what these guys are saying. Let's put some subtitles under them. <laughs> you know, we can understand what they're saying. And if you think about it, it's rather patronizing and condescending that these brothers have to make do with having subtitles when they're speaking English. But Garrett Loesch, who speaks with a heavy German Austrian accent, doesn't need any subtitles whatsoever. Encouragement. It comes in many forms, and it can affect our lives in ways we never imagined. The couple being interviewed were truly happy. They were enjoying so many blessings in Jehovah's service. Their secret? They simplified their life. After that assembly, we really thought about how we could do more to serve Jehovah. Working to maintain a pattern of life is exhausting. Even our vacations were tiring. We were both working to maintain our lifestyle. But our lifestyle was controlling us. We were spending money without even a thought. It seemed we were never satisfied with what we had. In one of Jesus' illustrations, a rich man built bigger storehouses so he could store all his things. If you're one of those ex-witnesses who continues to hold on to this fantasy that the governing body are really cynical and know exactly what they're doing and every, every move that they make, every policy that they put in writing is all part of some master plan to <laughs> just to dupe people and uh, and put themselves in a better situation. If you're one of these people who, who genuinely believes they're cynical, all you really need to do to debunk that theory is watch this clip. Because what the governing body wants is, even though it's running out of money, even though it desperately needs donations from its eight million Jehovah's Witnesses, it's telling its 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses, we want you to be poor, we want you to be broke, we want you to get rid of any well-paying jobs that you have and become window cleaners so you can preach more and distribute our literature more. That is not the decision of a cynical uh, group of men who want to become more wealthy, who want to profit financially. That is the decision of a group of men who believe themselves to be representatives of God and who genuinely believe that they are fronting God's organisation and that expanding that organisation with members is more important than, than anything because, you know, Armageddon's coming. It all falls into place once you watch this clip. And what a selfish, evil thing it is to persuade young Jehovah's Witness couples that no, they shouldn't think about their future. They shouldn't think about making their lives comfortable. Who wants a comfortable life? Who wants to be able to go on holidays? What you really, really need is to uh, drop everything and become unpaid propaganda distributors for the rest of your lives. What an evil, evil thing that is. And it's a recurring theme now in JW Broadcasting episodes. Either the governing body is telling kids not to go to college, or in this case, it's telling, you know, well-educated, capable, um, you know, young men and women who are married to drop everything and not make themselves in a position to maybe have children, support children later on in life, 
uh, and make sure the next generation is, is well provided for. No, the organisation always comes first, sacrifice, 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 any kind of energy, any kind of talents that you have, we want them. An utterly, utterly selfish stance to take and it carries on into the next clip I've selected for you. We meditated on what matters most and we were determined to simplify our life. We had stored up many things and it wasn't easy letting go. But the more we let go, the more we felt free. We analyzed our expenses. And we made adjustments. We prayed to Jehovah before making any decisions. With time and effort, we came to have more joy and freedoms we didn't think possible. Simplifying your life can take time, and it is not easy. But the reward Jehovah gives can far outweigh any sacrifice we make. With nothing to hold us back, we were now in a position to accept any assignment Jehovah gave us. Now we could share our joy with others. We are truly happy. Our secret? We live a simple life. So the couple sells all of their belongings, uh, they have a garage sale and they also put their house on the market so they sell their house, they quit their well paying jobs, um, they, get, they start a new enterprise as window cleaners and by the way I've done window cleaning <laughs> and I can tell you it is not fun. Um, I tried it for about four months when I was about 20. Uh, and I was actually recommended to do window cleaning by an elder in uh, in my congregation, and because that was you know that was considered to be the way to make money if you uh, wanted to pioneer. So I tried window cleaning for three or four months, and it was I, I probably shouldn't have started in the winter, <laughs> but I did. So as you can imagine, it was freezing cold, miserable in the British you know winter. A freezing hands and um, dipping into you know cold buckets of water and uh, what really clinched it for me and made me think no I, I can't do this this just isn't worth it is I had maybe two or three falls off my ladders 
So <laughs> I have had that feeling where, where I'm on the top of the ladder and I can see the house disappearing into the distance <laughs> because the ladder is falling backwards or maybe it's sliding down the wall. That happened to me as well. And it happened maybe two or three times and I just thought, no, it's not worth it. Um, you know, my health is the most important thing and I don't care whether this is a convenient way for some people to pioneer, it's not right for me, so I stopped. But that's apparently what this young couple needs to now start doing, um, uh, doing menial work. But yes, you know, I'm not decrying window cleaners, I'm sure that there are some uh, people out there who genuinely, genuinely enjoy window cleaning and make a lot of money from doing it, but it isn't for everyone. And Watchtower seems to have this cookie cutter approach where if it's good for these pioneers, it's good for everybody and they should do it because it's menial and it, 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 um, it's, it's not going to get you into any high flying careers, which is what Watchtower seems to be terrified of. But yeah, you have this situation where the couple gives up everything, they give up their jobs, they give up their house, they give up their belongings and they go to Africa, <laughs> which apparently is having a simple life, getting on a plane and going to Africa and um, trying to rope in people who already have nothing, trying to rope them into a cult, you know, as though they already don't have enough to deal with. Um, but they're only able to go to Africa, I assume, because they've sold their house. So what they're doing really is squandering their money from the house that they're never going to be able to buy back or they're never going to be able to buy anything like it again because they've become window cleaners. So what a sad, sad story. Um, and yes, it's one thing to say, oh, we're happy. And it's one thing to stand on a platform and say you're happy, but you then have to go home that night and, you know, live in a pokey apartment, I'm, I'm assuming. Not that I'm one to talk, <laughs> but you then have to, um, struggle with making ends meet and it, it isn't fun being broke it really isn't fun being broke there's nothing happy about it um you know i'm not i'm not desperate to become rich and wealthy some would say i already am <laughs> but um the one thing i would like is to not worry about money i wouldn't like anymore to worry about money and i can it was only a few months ago I mean, our, our translation business is doing a little bit better these days, but it was only a few months ago that Deanna and I were, you know, walking around a supermarket with a calculator in our hands because we had to make sure we didn't go past a certain amount with our groceries. I don't want to be there again, thank you. It's not fun. And it's as a direct, that was as a direct result of the fact that we did exactly what this young couple did and we squandered. Um, our young energy on working part-time for far too long. I mean, you can maybe manage it for a few months or maybe a couple of years, um, but sooner or later, the money's going to start running out. And not only is the money going to run out, but you're going to start racking up debt, which uh, is exactly what happens for couples in that situation, or at least it happened to us. And we're still paying off the debt that we uh, ac accumulated while we were pioneering. So uh, please, if you're a young witness couple watching this video, do not make that mistake. Uh, Watchtower is literally trying to bleed you of all of your energy, all of your promise and all of your prospects and all of your potential and basically just wants to get the best out of you and then cast you, to, cast you aside once you can't give any more. Don't do it. Uh, there's only one life, live it now make the most out of it. Don't be ashamed to be happy. Don't be ashamed to be successful and just go for it. Do whatever you want to do in life and do whatever makes you happy. But I can assure you being broke for a cult is nothing to be happy about. A nice experience. There's kids, young boys playing soccer in the streets, bare feet, using bricks as goalposts and playing right up until after sunset. Even at school playing at lunch breaks, Playing soccer was like culture for us. I couldn't see anything else better than soccer. I ended up representing the province and then played for the youth national teams, representing the country and then got chosen to play professional soccer with one of the local clubs. And then eventually I went overseas to play in different tournaments in countries like Belgium, Netherlands, France, and Germany.
it's funny when I was first watching this episode I was really impressed as I said before with Garrett Lowe she played it safe there wasn't really too much I could criticize with him and I was looking forward to having very little to talk about in this video but then the producers of JW Broadcasting um, irritate me <laughs> repeatedly first with the couple who were told to become poor for Watchtower and then they take a pop at my favorite sport which is football or as Americans call it soccer so I absolutely love uh, soccer and that's why I've got a bad back actually because <laughs> the local guys who I play football with um, I couldn't resist going for one last game before winter and I sort of knew before I started playing that something was going to give with my back and it did and um, as a result of that I've ruined my back basically and I'm on painkillers at the moment waiting for it to fix itself but I absolutely love football and I think one of the things I most love about it and have always loved about it is that even if you're miserable and down and depressed, which you quite often are as a witness, I'm sorry you are, when you're on the field and there's a ball at your feet and you're with your team, nothing else matters. You can completely lose yourself and immerse yourself in the game and it irritates me that um, there has been this pattern of Watchtower taking a serious um, side swipe at competitive sports. It's done it in the magazines fairly recently and it's, you know, again targeting football in particular uh, in this video. It seems to have this idea, or the governing body seems to have this idea, that it's okay when it's just some kids running around in the dirt, um, you know, in a poor country, or it's okay if it's maybe some Bethelites or Gilead missionaries running around in a park somewhere, you know. Um, but the minute it gets competitive, no, you're not allowed to do it. Well, the competitive element is what makes it so enjoyable. You really, really enjoy it because it's competitive and because everyone cares whether they win or lose. If nobody cares whether they win or lose, it's no longer fun. Imagine playing chess with someone who isn't bothered about whether they win or not. It wouldn't be enjoyable, would it? And it's the same thing with football. And so you have this transition from it going to, you know, the sweet kids running around in the dirt with, with lumps of rock for goalposts, and then the competitive music <laughs> is, is kind of introduced, and then you have real footballers and a tackle <laughs> and a red card, you know, honestly. The way Watchtower somehow manages to demonize and stigmatize the most innocent things and make them seem as though they're from the devil, um, it really enrages me, especially when it's, as I say, a sport that's, that's close to my heart. And I do feel sorry for any young witnesses whose parents are watching this and who will now have further ammunition to make their children's lives miserable by denying them the... Uh, the, the scourge of playing football. I didn't know the Bible, although I had been going to church all my life and seeing the love at the Kingdom Hall there just made me realize that there was something in this and I had to look closely to see what it was. Isn't it interesting that again we have this horrendous reasoning. We had it in the last episode where we had the the young guy from um, who spoke low German from Mexico saying that he wanted to become a witness because he loved the love bombing basically at the meeting and he loved the music and that was th those were his reasons for becoming a Jehovah's Witness and now again we have this guy who you know gives up a promising career as a footballer and um, because he loves being love bombed at a meeting and because of the affection and love he was shown at a cult meeting uh, oh well there must be more to it you know, people aren't this nice to each other. People aren't this nice to each other for no reason. There must be a reason for them being nice to me, and that reason must be because this is God's organization. So I need to find the reasons why it's God's organization. That is never a good angle to approach a religion from. It's either true or it isn't. And you join a religion because it's true. You don't join a religion because they make you feel nice at a meeting. Dear personal study. Bible reading and meditation helped me realize that, hey, Jehovah requires that I put him first, and then professional soccer requires the same thing, full dedication. 
what now? Actually, professional soccer doesn't demand the same thing as Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> um, if you're a footballer, a professional footballer, and you fail to win a trophy, or you fail to win enough trophies throughout your career, uh, you're not going to be destroyed at Armageddon. <laughs> Cults, on the other hand, if you don't perform for them in the way that they dictate, uh, things could get very bad for you. And with Jehovah's Witnesses, what they want is all or nothing. We've already seen with the young couple. You give absolutely everything, um, and in return you get false promises. And in, at least in your mind, if you don't fulfill what's expected of you, you're going to die at Armageddon. That's a very different proposition to somebody who signs a professional footballing contract and in exchange for hard work gets money and success. That's all we're talking about, hard work. And for anything good in life, hard work is involved. I'm sorry, nothing gets handed to you on a plate. This whole idea of feeling entitled to good things just because we feel we should have them, it doesn't work that way. If you want good things, you've got to work for them and put in efforts. And the same is true with being a professional sports person or being in a decent career or being um, a scholar or a professor or a teacher or a doctor. Anything requires, anything good um, requires hard work. You know, in, in any area of life you wish to be, whether you're just a parent, if you want to be a good parent, guess what? Hard work, dedication, it's the only way to do it. And so for Watchtower to insist that anything that involves dedication other than following it, following the governing body, is meaningless and valueless and should be avoided and abandoned, uh, I'm not buying it and I'm sure a lot of people watching this video won't buy it either. I must say, deciding to quit professional soccer and serve Jehovah more fully was not an easy decision because I knew what it would involve. Disappointing my whole family, relatives, friends, my whole community, the whole country. People who were very close to me, who really loved me. With professional sport or soccer or any career in this world, there are no guarantees, you know. And with Jehovah, everything is guaranteed, as long as we put him first. Um, have I missed something? <laughs> Where are the guarantees with Jehovah's Witnesses? Where are the guarantees? There are promises, sure, but none of them are guaranteed. Um, the people in Russell's day who were promised Armageddon would come in 1914. They were let down. People in Rutherford's day who were promised that by 1925 there would be a new world order with Abraham, Moses and Samson in Jerusalem administering Earth's affairs as the ancient worthies. By 1925 they were let down. You know, people like my parents who were told, oh well Armageddon is going to come by 1975, it just is. They were let down. I was let down as a child being told that the generation that witnessed uh, the events of 1914 wouldn't die before Armageddon came. I was let down. You know, you talk about guarantees. <laughs> Repeatedly, guarantee after guarantee after guarantee is ripped to pieces and replaced by a new guarantee or promise. And that's what being a Jehovah's Witness is all about, being able to swallow the latest promise that's made to you and conveniently forgetting all of the promises that you've been let down on. And we know we've had one example already in this video where the congregations were asked to sign over their autonomy and sign over their responsibility for maintaining their own kingdom hall uh, in exchange for being looked after under a broad arrangement by Watchtower. Watchtower would take care of all of the building and all of the renovation work. Don't worry, just give us all the money and we'll take care of it for you. And already we've had that guarantee ripped to pieces by Sam Hurd saying, well, if we have the money, we'll do it. Well, you've already taken the money and you've already made that promise and you t you're tearing it to shreds in front of us. But unfortunately, witnesses are trained to have very short memories and to forget exactly what it, has, what it, what it was that they were promised so that when new promises come, um, it's like being a goldfish. You just, oh, look at that. <laughs> Short memories is what a short memory is what's required if you want to be a Jehovah's Witness. There was great anticipation in the air. 
Brother Splain was present for the special meeting, and what a joy it was to discover that the Bible had been revised and was now available in Brazilian Portuguese. Because here today, we have the New World Translation in Portuguese. Everyone present received their own personal copy of the New Revised Bible. So we had similar scenes, didn't we, when the New World, revised New World Translation was released in 2013. You had the governing body riding to the rescue. Look what we're providing you with, never mind the fact that we've not been printing or supplying Bibles for the last few months and leaving you to guess what we were doing. Now we're giving you Bibles, which you already have, but we've tweaked the wording slightly. And then you have this ecstatic audience with scenes of jubilation and people hugging their Bibles and tears and crying and, you know, <laughs> almost lurid, you know, scenes of passion between people and books. Um, very, very strange, cult-like and disturbing. And again, all these people are getting is what they already had, slightly repackaged. The governing body didn't write the Bible they're just interpreting it for us and giving their revision of the text. Um, and I, I must say on this, you know, the new Bibles, I actually quite like the way they look. I like the new, the, the grey look. I've now got two versions, the, the middle sized one and the small sized one. I'm waiting to get a large one, you know, to complete the set. I like the way they look aesthetically, but they will go down in history as uh, follies they will be pointed to with mockery and derision uh, within a few decades. Why? Because they contain 1914. They have in the back these um, diagrams showing the chronology of um, Jehovah's Witness teachings. And it, sh it says about 1914, Jesus was enthroned. Why it says about and not just 1914, I don't know. But they tied themselves firmly to this date of 1914, which is disappearing, has already disappeared in the rear view mirror of history because they are themselves deluded and they have themselves bought into this broader dynamic of 1914 and 1919 and the faithful and discreet slave and you know Rutherford and what have you. They have to hold on to it. They can't prize their fingers away from it. So I'm, I'm getting distracted now, but I just thought it was worthwhile pausing on these scenes of jubilation and, um, you know, quite disturbing behaviour for adults to be engaged in getting so worked up about what is essentially just another Bible. While the Bible was being distributed, those in attendance heard a chorus sing the new songs in Portuguese. Isn't it interesting that David Splain really seems to fancy himself as a choir conductor? <laughs> He's popped up in a few videos now on um, JW Broadcasting where they're, you know, releasing a new song and it has to be David Splain who's waving his arms in front of these Bethelites. And we see it again now in, in Brazil where he's orchestrating um, these singers. And uh, yeah, it's interesting that I'm, I'm pretty sure he won't have had formal training <laughs> in music. Um, I can't help but wonder whether it's purely a power thing and wanting to come across as multi-talented. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I just find it interesting that David Splain really fancies himself as a choir conductor. When I wake up to a ministry day, I enjoy waking up to that day because I look forward to it. I have fun doing the ministry with the friends. 
I love showing the Caleb videos to the little kids at the door. But it hasn't always been so easy. I have autism. Loud noises were really, really hard for me. Like when the audience laughed or clapped. Or even crowds. Like a lot of people, you just can't be around them. Because you just feel like this is too much. Family worship was difficult when I was eight or nine. And I just didn't really want to do it. It was getting on my nerves. It was just not really easy. Some days it felt impossible to go to school. There was a day when I went outside and I just like, I cannot go back in there. One time, a kid came out of nowhere and just pushed me over. It made me feel physical pain and emotional pain. When other kids were playing without me, it just made me feel a little upset that they're leaving me out. It just makes me feel a bit lonely. At first, my parents did not know how to communicate with me. I had mental and social challenges. The brothers and sisters could not understand what I was doing. My parents found out I had autism. Then as the years passed, it got easier and easier for them to communicate with me. The friends in the congregation have helped me by doing whatever they need to do to help me stay on the road to life. Some of the ways that my parents have helped me to learn about Jehovah are household activities, like making food, going out in nature, and family worship. My parents took a new route by situating spiritual things all day long instead of one thing once or twice a week. And now, family worship cannot be better. My relationship with Jehovah has helped me overcome challenges. He is also a better friend to me than ever before. By family worship, Bible reading, personal Bible reading, and I do like the whiteboard animations. Beating a bully without using your fist, it's helped me to show how to deal with it. Actually, I, right then, I was starting to experience some bad things going on in my school, and when they started doing those whiteboard animations, it pretty much saved me. We just love him so much. He's just been such a bright spot. He loves giving pictures to people. They're a little piece of him, whether it's a picture of a really cool car or, you know, whatever he's drawn. It's, he's handing you a piece of himself. Well, I can remember when I was his age. I would never be up in front of that many people. Uh, Jaden has dealt with that fear, and he seems very comfortable with it now. He's not afraid to speak in front of the congregation, and the congregation's very supportive. I feel like I've been an important part of the congregation by publishing. When I took a personal interest of those I meet in the ministry, I started getting return visits and I started showing videos. In fact, we are studying the good news from God brochure. Really, anytime Jaden answers, the congregation really pays attention. He speaks from his heart when he answers, and the brothers and sisters really appreciate that. It was really fun to take a trip to New York. Bethel was very fun. I got to meet some of the brothers and sisters. I also felt like I was part of something. When I was at Bethel, they helped me make a box. I don't know where that box went, but I knew I was helping somebody to come into the truth and become closer to Jehovah. We've really seen how Jehovah has greatly blessed Jaden. Because he has his own ministry, he's able to practice his social skills both at the door and with the brothers and sisters that are out in service. And we really feel that Jehovah has created the perfect environment for Jaden to thrive spiritually. I can't believe that this is actually happening, that I'm actually born into Jehovah's organization. Thank you, Jehovah. Well, isn't that just a double whammy of bad luck? Jaden is born into a cult uh, and he's born with autism and neither of those things are fun to have to deal with but 
I think what irritates me about this video is the fact that um, his problems are celebrated. It's celebrated the fact that he has this condition is, is already challenging enough without having to shoehorn it in around all of these other requirements that are associated with growing up as a witness. And I found a lot about Jaden's story was fairly generic about the experience of growing up as a witness anyway, whether you have autism or not. It's challenging to go to school. It's challenging to be the odd one out. It's challenging to be the weird kid who feels he has to preach to his classmates. It's challenging to have to, you know, sit with your family once a week and talk about stuff that you're not that interested in as a child. Because, you know, let's face it, children aren't born religious. They have to have it pummeled into them. So all of those things are challenging enough without having to also deal with uh, autism. And again, this shameless propaganda piece exploits one child's uh, illness um, and uses that as a reason to try and entice people into the organization or stick to it. Look at what this child has achieved. Look at how this child has been obedient to what's required of him. If he can do it, you can do it too. And that's the message. And, uh, and, and as well, a reminder to parents that if they have kids, this is what they should be doing as well. They should be pummeling indoctrinating, getting watchtower's requirements into the brains of young people as young as possible. So quite a depressing uh, section. I'm sorry if I've exposed you to, to too long a clip there because it is quite uh, disturbing. But it's worth highlighting the kind of propaganda that we're now having to get used to where watchtower is willing to cross any barrier, cross any line of decency if it means getting its message across, even if it's at the expense of a young boy who has already got more than enough on his plate. Imagination and meditation These are the things that help me see They give me insight to help me do right And be the person I should be The person I should be it's funny that we're ending on this clip where <laughs> this really cheesy song um, is showing uh, material, clips of material about the generation. And we, ha we talked about the overlapping generation teaching in the last video and how outrageous and bizarre it is. And the lyrics go, um, imagination is really what you need. <laughs> yes, you need a lot of imagination to uh, accept the overlapping generation teaching. In fact, you need, you need a healthy amount of imagination to accept pretty much everything that the organization teaches, especially about its history. And we saw there, you know, a still of Judge Rutherford teaching in the forest somewhere. Uh, honestly, please, if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, if you don't do anything else, well, actually, the most important thing is that you do the research on blood transfusions, but you also really need to look into Judge Rutherford and what a crazy, crazy character he was. Read the Wikipedia page on Judge Rutherford just for a start, and that will at least give you a hint that he is not the, you know, the wonderful um, leader that uh, he's cracked up to be in Watchtower folklore. So I thought I'd leave it there for this video. Again, Garrett Loesch uh, by himself did a very good job and did it pretty much how I would do it if I was in his shoes. But it was let down really by the really blatant, overt, heart-tugging uh, propaganda, as always, that gets inserted in the form of these dramatizations and experiences that get added on. And uh, it's really the whole reason why I do these videos is because I feel there needs to be some kind of answer to it all. Um, I think a lot of it can you can figure it out yourself just by watching it and thinking about it. But I know that when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you aren't really trained to think about it critically. You're just trained to accept it. And I wanted there to be something on YouTube or somewhere on the internet where you're at least assisted to look behind the curtain and see this dreadful material for what it really is. So. I hope you found 
this episode interesting. Uh, just a heads up, I will be going quite quiet over December. I know we're just now at the beginning of November, um, but I just want to give you a heads up that during December I will be really getting my head down with my book and trying to get it over the finish line. And in November, I'm also going to be busy trying to get my apartment finished. So um, I will be quite stretched with my activism work, but I will be covering any huge stories that come out uh, or doing my best to cover them. And I've also promised to do a video on da, 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 on 607 BCE, uh, which is a subject that I can't honestly say was that important to me, but the more I've kind of interacted with the other XJWs, the more I've realized that this is actually a subject that is of concern to a lot of XJWs and a lot of JWs who are just starting to do their research. So it is worthwhile explaining this and I will be producing a video that deals with 607 and 1914 and 539 and all of those things at some point over the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that and I hope you've found this video interesting and thank you for watching.